Welcome everybody to Theme Thursday and uh, Pastel Societies in California hosts two Theme Thursdays a month. Uh, you can find out when and what we're hosting, uh, what, our, what our theme is, uh, if you go to pssewebsite.org, that's pssewebsite.org. So um, part of our mission statement is to educate the public on all things pastel, we talk art. You don't have to participate if you don't want to, you can just sit and watch or, or, or get creative and paint with us. So. We have some fabulous, fabulous artists uh, who are more than willing to answer your questions and uh, and to share their ideas. So again, theme Thursdays every other Thursday at uh, at uh, here on Zoom. So again, pssewebsite.org. So thank you for being here, everybody. I really, really um, appreciate all of you being here to uh, see my little presentation regarding creating the narrative. Uh, and I would like to introduce our presenter tonight, the gentleman who, is, who has been speaking to us. And for those of, the, of you who do not or have not met Otto yet, this is Otto Stirk. Otto, um, boy, you are such a youngin. <laughs> Otto grew up in uh, Southern California. He is primarily self-taught. And at some point, Otto joined the US Marine Corps in hopes of attaining financial aid to attend an art college. His plans were momentarily altered in 1991 when he was called to serve in Desert Storm. Soon after his military service, Otto enrolled in art workshops and courses at several local art associations and colleges while launching his illustration career under the mentorship of Mike Butkus. Working as an illustrator served Otto for honing many techniques and found pastels to be his principal medium of choice. Now, Otto is a representational artist who is greatly influenced by the Dutch masters. He seeks to impart sincerity, contemplation, and an admiration for the classical in a contemporary world by depicting the personal, the emotional, and the quiet elegance in his paintings through light, shadow, and texture. He aims to create an allegorical narrative and an intriguing balance within the realm of light and dark, which is a main component why this is such a great topic for this evening's uh, theme Thursday. Otto, your list of recognitions just continues to grow. Would you just go ahead and tell us about a few of your <laughs> past few achievements? Because uh, otherwise, I'll be taking up. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, no, I, I don't. I don't want to. I want too much. But um, so I appreciate it. I. I uh, I, I recently got uh, in the general membership, I got the uh, best of show uh, for the Pastel Society of the West Coast Moose show, which is just recent. Um, and uh, and I also, uh, well, we talked about this last time uh, when Glenn was doing his uh, his uh, theme Thursday uh, that I got my master circle. So with the, uh, with IAP, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'll see you guys in Albuquerque. I'll be uh, accepting, I'll be walking the stage uh, and accepting that medal. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. So I, I sincerely, Sincerely appreciate the kudos. Thank you. I uh, I also sincerely appreciate uh, everyone who's joining us here this evening uh, for my uh, presentation on creating the narrative. And and uh, so it, it's it's like you said, like Kath mentioned, I'm very inspired by the Dutch masters, and you can see that in my work, which I'll be discussing in just a bit. Uh, but before I go any further, I want to say thank you to Kath and to all the PSSC staff who continue to make Theme Thursdays a popular program. It is going, it is coming now on one year since we had our inaugural Theme Thursday, which Dave Dobianco, our programs director, uh, former program uh, former director of programs, uh, did his first uh, Theme Thursday, uh, and that was Animal. So we want to welcome. David back in two weeks uh, to honor that anniversary, and he'll be doing uh, he'll be doing a theme Thursday uh, theme Thursday on drawing dogs, which he does spectacularly. So thank you so much, David, for doing that. All right. So before we go any further, you guys, you know what? I don't mind if you unmute because I don't. I love the interaction. Just keep in mind that you know any do bogs dro uh, excuse me, bogs darking. Uh, any dogs barking, <laughs> or, or hey, any uh, any radios or anything going on in the background, just 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 be mindful of that because um, it does pick up all of that in the conversation. So it's it's hard for anybody uh, watching and listening on YouTube uh, to to make things out. So yeah, so I, I don't mind if you unmute and, and and interact. So I love that stuff. All right, well, uh, thank you so much again for being here, and I'll start my presentation now. 
creating the narrative. As I mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the email that every painting has a story, right? Every painting has a story. And so it has an origin. How did it start? What clicked that spark of creativity? And what saw it through? Now, first, before I get too much into allegory, you know, I want to just help, you know, have you understand that, that when it comes to a narrative, it doesn't have to be allegorical, that, that, that deep hidden message. It, it can have um, any kind of narrative that, that follows, you know, well, I, I'd say that if you, if you follow through with a painting, with a certain story, it not only does it help you create a better painting, and that's just my belief, it helps you create a better painting, because you understand how it started and how it's going to end, right? So that could be about color, value. It could be your, the story about your focal point. So there's so many different ways to create a narrative in a painting. Uh, now, some paintings, now, if, oh, let me start sharing. All right, so let me go ahead and I'm gonna share now if that's okay with you. And let's see, let's go here. All right, can you guys see okay? Yes. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yep. So now, okay, what is allegory? Anybody know allegory? Telling a story. It is, it is. Allegory basically in the artistic form, um, it's, it's a narrative or it's a, a vis, uh, visual representation of a person, place, or thing um, that in essence, represents a, a hidden meaning or perhaps a, a deeper message. And deeper message. much of our history, much of our history um, is rooted in storytelling. So, you know, I mean, who doesn't love a good story, right? I mean, you know, your uncle's story every Thanksgiving gets better and better as the years pass by, right? It gets more suspenseful, it gets more dramatic, whatever it might be. But artists have been using this for centuries, for centuries, creating a, a narrative and uh, much of it being about uh, 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 much, but much of it being about a, a moral uh, understanding or perhaps a political message. Um, it could be very personal. So um, again, uh, allegory again can helps artists create this hidden meaning behind a painting, and so. And, oh, and one thing, by, by the way, allegory, uh, if you guys don't know, allegory actually comes from the Latin word allegoria, which means veiled language. So, you know, and, and if you guys didn't know that, it's it just basically, you know, we're always disguising artists, right? Uh, uh, um, artists who paint in allegory are always, again, trying to unwrap these neatly packaged ideas. And what's so fun about that is that it allows the viewer to dig into that painting and discover for themselves that little surprise of, ah, what does this painting mean? What is the artist saying? So um, again, it's something that I truly uh, enjoy doing in my pieces. Now, some paintings uh, pretty much wear their story on their sleeves, right? So a perfect example of that would be <laughs> The Shiner. And, and now, Norbert Rockwell uh, is one of my, my all-time favorite artists. I mean, you know, you can look at one of his paintings and he does hide little things in there, but for the most part, you know, you can in instantly read what's going on in his paintings, right? Uh, so, you know, he's, he's such a wonderful, wonderful draftsmanship and look at his composition, his, his palette. I mean, he's just phenomenal. And, and the fact that he was able to do all these paintings and on time, it's just, just shows what a ridiculous draftman he was. It's just, just uh, completely amazing. Um, as the years went by, uh, you could see how some of his uh, work changed. And so, you know, his messages got a little more subtle in some aspects, right? So you have uh, this piece called The, the Runaway. And, and so this one perhaps doesn't read as fast as The, uh, as the Shiner. But, uh, but nonetheless, it is, it is just a beautiful example of uh, how Norman Rockwell got his narrative across. So uh, his artwork is just absolutely stunning, um, which uh, I've now, in my, when I was growing up, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, art 
in my house. They're, uh, my parents knew little about the art world. And, and I, recall, um, I recall being introduced to Norman Rockwell because of my, my oldest sister who had a puzzle uh, had a puzzle uh, and, and she was putting it together. And I believe the piece, the title of the, of the piece itself was The Homecoming, A Soldier uh, Coming Home. And that's how I was introduced to Norman Rockwell. And I just studied then, studied this puzzle, it was just, just mesmerizing how, how much he put into this painting. And, uh, and it just got me thinking about how an artist can say so much visually. Uh, it's just, uh, it was really interesting to me. And I believe it was, it was one of those moments that, uh, that, that helped me understand that an artist can say a lot um, through his paintings. And so I'll get a little bit more into that. Uh, and another little example here of paintings that tell the, where their story on their sleeve is the screen, right? Now, for you guys, you guys may not know, but this piece, did you guys know it was in pastel? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> did you also know, another little fun fact, did you also know that this piece is the most expensive pastel in the world? It sold for millions of dollars. I think, believe it was 2012. It was an astronomical amount. And, uh, and so even though there was different versions of, um, of the screen, this piece specifically in pastel is the highest selling pastel in the world. So. It's just a, a phenomenal piece. But, uh, but getting into uh, work that is a little more subtle um, in meaning, and one of my favorite artists is Jan Vermeer. Jan Vermeer being a, a Dutch artist who unfortunately only lived to be about 43 years old. Now, um, this piece uh, specifically is a painting about, in fact, most Dutch artists were known to paint about peace and tranquility. Jan Vermeer was, was just amazing when it comes to painting light. Um, but each one of these pieces creates uh, a sense of serenity. And in this piece itself, uh, titled The uh, Woman Reading a Letter, um, You'll note that, that this piece was actually inspirational in one of my pieces, which I'll show you in just a little bit. But I don't know if you guys knew, but Jan Vermeer doesn't have a, didn't complete a whole lot of paintings. I mean, he maybe has about 35 paintings to his name. Okay. And the fact that he lived in a very tiny house with 11 children, a wife and a mother-in-law <laughs> is fascinating that he could complete such, <laughs> such, <laughs> such paintings, you know, that, that just exude that serenity. And, um, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm assuming this is probably his wife in one of her, uh, in one of her states, right? <laughs> For one of her 11 children. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so uh, again, Jenna Ramir was just, was just uh, phenomenal in, uh, in creating these, these beautiful paintings. And so, uh, which brings me to, um, you know, my next piece, which I'm gonna, I'll show you uh, is, is my, my piece that um, I titled To Love and Light. And um, the only thing I want to note is that, that there was, you know, such a similarity because I grew up in a small household with a lot of people in the house. I have, uh, I have six sisters, a brother, uh, right, it's mom and dad. And then it seemed like we always had some sort of relatives from Mexico or something or other. So it just, it was a packed house. So it, maybe it's no wonder that I too am looking for some sort of peace and serenity in my paintings. Um, well, which brings me to, again, this piece inspired um, this piece, which is to love and, mm. uh, to love and light. And uh, this is uh, done on UART 600 papers at 12 by 16. But I, I wanted to thank Gail Sibley for uh, doing this critique of my painting a, a few years ago. She did, she did such a, a wonderful job of unwrapping, right? Unwrapping um, the allegory and 
um, the meaning behind what I was trying to say. So she really got the gist of it. So if you if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to read uh, what she wrote and uh, you know see what kind of meaning you guys might get from this. Um, ah, a still act. But there's nothing ordinary about this one. All the parts are beautifully executed, the reflected metal of the jug, the leathery skin of pomegranates, the numbly buds and smooth leaf of the eucalyptus, the silkiness of the cloth, a strong off-center vertical rest on a dark horizontal plane. And then there's the moth, caught mid-flight, lightening and balancing out the heaviness of the composition. So tiny, yet such an important and terrible part of the piece. I enjoy the play here on the idea of the still light. All the pieces in the arrangement are to be expected, but the flying moth doesn't belong, unless, of course, it's brought to a standstill by the painter. Two other parts that hold me to this painting, I'll just move this up a little bit so you guys can see. Two other parts that hold me to this painting are the edge of a frame on the upper right, barely seen, and the shape, handle of another jug, on the far left. Both didn't need to be there. They are hardly worth mentioning, but remove them by replacing your hands over them and see the change. The soft yet dramatic lighting that shafts diagonally, diagonally across the dark picture both brings out our attention to the moth and creates a quiet movement. In that band of light also sits the jug. And we can't help but be mesmerized by the reflection in the picture. What is, what is being reflected? I can't make it out, but what I see reminds me of a cocoon, which in turn makes me think of the moth and the metamorphosis it's been through. The moth flies toward to the reflection and to the light. And what meaning can we make? Can we take from this? So, I mean, I, so I, I just I, again I, I thank uh, Gail for doing such a, a wonderful job of trying to dissect the meaning behind this. And so, this is where I'd like to invite you guys to see what your thoughts might be on what this moth represents and what meaning you guys take from this piece. Anybody? You can unmute if you have something to say. <laughs> well, I, I think I see the moth seeing his own reflection there with the giant wings. Yes, that's, that's what, what I, I see. It looks like larger than life. And yes. the moth, you know, who's very tiny, sees this giant reflection. Almost like angel wings. Yeah. That's what I see. I don't know if that's what you intended but that. that's, no, that's, that's okay that's okay that's okay you know what sometimes i do sometimes i do give it away right sometimes i, I give the whole story <laughs> about you. yeah but some paintings you know you just i just i let you take whatever meaning you want to take from it and i and i think because again it can be very personal to certain people now uh, did somebody libby did you have something to say or anybody else yes i see balance i i see that my eye is being drawn to the moth. You know, the weight is on the left, but my eye is to the right. Correct. And, and thank you. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I just wanna see if there's anybody else with any other comment, and then I'll go into it just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, this is Daniel. I, Daniel. Hi, I see a, a hint of um, kind of a, the, the saying, better beautiful than perfect. I, I feel like there's a, very beautiful still life set up and then a little bit of humor where you have this little intruder coming in and you know even though it's you you try and set up something perfect sometimes it's the little imperfection or the little intruder the unexpected that really ties together the beauty and that kind of overpowers the perfection thank you thank you uh, oh. i have a comment also yes please and yes. Who, who's this uh sylvia sylvia yes um on this, uh, the, the fruit that's in the, the pomegranates, yes. the one is obviously on the downside of ripeness. Mm -hmm. And I see the butterfly as more of the, the rebirth going on, the rejuvenation. Ah, ah thank you. Yes, I, all I, of you. All of I you see, really, yes, somebody else? I, I see th that the pleasures of, in, of life can be fleeting. Ah, ah. <laughs> thank you thank you yes yes and so now let me dig a little deeper into this so you guys can understand what i was trying to do with this piece now did you see any comparison between what vermeer's and this piece not that i'm even trying to like say i'm anywhere near vermeer but did you see how his piece might have inspired mine 
right? The light that God the lighting, light. the shaft of lighting coming from the yes, left, that yes. window on the left that he always used in most of, the, of his paintings. Yeah, and yeah, that actually, yeah, yes. also, yes, sir. Uh, um, sorry, did, did I cut you off? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, okay. Um, the significance of the moth, it to me is uh, kind of um, uh, uh, it's subtle but but very true. Is that the moth is a creature of the night. And it's attracted to brightness. Yeah. That's the first thing. And the other thing is, I see this in very musical terms, is that this is like an orchestral passage with, with the, 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 uh, the orchestra, you know, and um, the, uh, the, the, bo uh, the, the jug and the reflections represents very much um, uh, strings such as, um, you know, violins and violas. Whereas the two fruits, boom, boom, are like <laughs> uh, timpani to me. And the, uh, the, the moth, not the butterfly, is this silent solo act mm -hmm. being drawn to the light. Yes. That's all. No, Thank, you. Thank you. Because all of you, all of, all of you has really had some, really dug into this, and I, and I sincerely appreciate it. What Gil got too was the fact that look at the narrative of the composition as well, right? Where you have this barely visible chair on the left and you have that barely visible frame keeping you in, right? Cracking you in to try to create that sense. Now look at the, the when we're talking about, and I'll get in a little bit to the allegory, but um, just in the narrative of the composition, there's a triangle there. You guys see that, right? You see the triangle mm -hmm. from down from the buds up to the, up to the, uh, up to the jug and then downwards towards the moth. And that light, right, helps emphasize that, draws you down and to the moth. Now, the allegory itself is that, the symbolism here is that pomegranates all represent passion, they represent life, they, they represent some, some decadence. And yes, I believe uh, it was Daniel who said, uh, was it Daniel or no, excuse me, it was Chris, who said that life is fleeting. And you'll notice that in many of my paintings, very rarely do you find anything perfect, right? There's always a little bit of mar, there's some scars or something because that in essence to life. Life, you carry your burdens. Can you get grow old in grace? All these things are fleeting. And to the title itself, to love and life, um, the things that I want to be attracted to, right? Not the shiny things, right? The things that matter most. And so maybe this jug is an obstacle, right? Maybe, right. maybe this moth is a soul transcending into the other world, right? Has lived its life, has gone through its passion and now he's going to his final resting place, to the light. So the laurel leaf, excuse me, the eucalyptus leaf, right? Which represents rejuvenation, represents sense of knowledge. And so our wisdom has come to fruition and our life has now gone to another place. And as they say, love is everlasting. So the triangle representing the Trinity, if you want to look at, you know, uh, I know it's not a perfect triangle, but, you know, so there's, there's I grew up Catholic, <laughs> and so there's, there's some meaning in there, but, uh, but that, that, that moth that represents our soul. And so I want to thank all of you guys for, you know, your input on this, on this piece, because again, it's, uh, it's 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 these paintings that I I paint these paintings because I need to feel a connection to my pieces and so some of these my paintings can become very very personable I need them to be in order for me to be attached to them because they take so many hours to complete so I've got to stay motivated and and I just I, I try to pour myself into uh, my piece and and I don't know how, how many of you feel that same way uh, with your pieces and 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 how do you connect to your own pieces and in, in what way. So uh, sometimes I'll hide personal items, 
sometimes I won't. But when you look at this foundation and how heavy it is, here is this moth floating, weightless, right? Letting go of all of that, right? Nothing holds it down. And so, um, again, so there's, there's even more meaning to this, but I will, I think I've given up quite, quite a bit of the way, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad you guys uh, in, in, enjoyed that. Um, and moving on, because this would be a very good time, a very good time for me to finally introduce to you my all-time favorite art critic and art historian. And who would that be? Well, <laughs> it is... Sister Wendy Beckett. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not familiar with Sister Wendy Beckett, well, Sister Wendy became uh, popular in the 1990s and New York Times stated at the time that she became the most unlikely and famous art critic in the history of television. And I discovered her on PBS. And she had, a, she had uh, several shows. Um, and uh, one was called The Odyssey or something. But the one that, that I got to know her from was, oddly enough, the show titled The Story of Painting, uh, which I have a, a clip of I want to share with you. Now, Sister Wendy was born in 1930 and unfortunately uh, left us in, in uh, just a few years ago, in, in 2018. And uh, if you don't know a little bit about her history, she actually became, uh, she actually went into solitude. Uh, went to solitude and took a vow of silence for quite a long time. But I'm grateful that she decided not to be a hermit for the rest of her life because her insight and her vivaciousness, did I say that right? I hope I did. Um, it's just remarkable how she can express and explain to you the narrative of a painting. And so when I'm when I discovered Sister Wendy, um, it wasn't so much about how did that artist paint that. I became very interested in why did they paint that? Because yes, I'm enthused by realism and, and how some of these Dutch artists could implement such technical um, prowess into their pieces, but it was just it was just phenomenal how she explained all these narratives from the impressionist to the um, to the romanticist, to everything. So I, I, just, I just thought that you should know that if you want to see Sister Wendy, you can. There are plenty of videos uh, about Sister Wendy, and she just explains everything so well. But I have a really nice, juicy little tidbit of a video uh, that, I'd like to show you, that I'd like to share with you, and uh, it's regarding the Impressionist. So here's Sister Wendy. Uh, be warned. She had a love-hate relationship with Degas. Why shouldn't art be light-hearted? I can imagine Renoir asking that question. He paints the world without sadness, where there's nothing dark or sinister. I'm afraid I'm one of those unfortunate people who are not wildly enthusiastic about Renoir. <laughs> For me, personally, his colours are often too pretty and sweet. However, I defy anybody not to warn to the luncheon of the boating party. He's collected a group of friends. They've been on the river. They've had a wonderful lunch look with that enticing debris in the centre. And they're relaxing. It's a celebration of enjoyment. Outside, you can see the blur of the sunlit landscape, but he's collected them under an awning to emphasize they're a party. And you can pick up some relationships. This young man is very interested in the girl in front of him, but she's interested in this young man. And he's gazing enamored across at the pretty girl who's looking at her dog. And here we get a hint of something deeper, because that pretty girl was Aileen, whom Renoir loved. And very soon after he painted this picture, he proposed to her. And she was only 19, 
she had a country girl's wisdom. And though she loved him, she told him to go away and think about it a bit more. And it was 10 years before they actually got married. And this painting shows exactly why she knew he wasn't ready for marriage. It's a painting about bachelor life, no commitments, no responsibilities, able just to enjoy yourself when you wanted. He was a, a, a jovial, rather happy-go-lucky man, Redmore, with a great eye for the ladies. And this profoundly appealed to him, the party life. But he also loved Aileen and really wanted to marry her, and he's torn between the two. And it's this tension that makes this, even for me, a Renoir that truly works. Impressionism wasn't just the world of men, and women weren't just there to be painted. Now, for the first time, women artists begin to make their mark. This is Bette Morrison, one of the three upper-class daughters whose mother decided they should take painting lessons. And believe it or not, the youngest turned out to be one of the great painters of the 19th century. She didn't paint like a lady at all, but like a savage, like a prisoner in chains, they said. Like a baby. Even for a rich and liberated spinster, life was still decidedly domestic. The artist Mary Cassette was an expatriate American living in Paris. The great Degas knew her and admired her work, but reluctantly. His grumpy comment was, she paints too well to be a woman. Degas was deeply contemptuous of women, which is strange seeing that he painted them obsessively all his life. And he's best known for his pictures of the ballet dancers at the Paris Opera. And wouldn't you think that it would be the stars that he'd be interested in? Not at all. It was the chorus. He wanted to see behind the scenes. He was one of life's voyeurs. And a perfect example is that girl sitting on the piano, scratching her back, which is something we don't do when we're being watched. But there's another side to it. We don't do it, but animals do. And then one remembers with a shock that the Parisian name for these little dancers was the rats. And you look again, and you see the only fully realized person there is Monsieur Perrault the male. And isn't he standing there rather like an animal trainer? Not one of these little dancers comes across as a personality. Great body language, yes. He's rarely looked at them. He's seen how tired they are, how bored, how some are showing off to Monsieur Perrault. But he doesn't look with sympathy. He sees just the bodies. And I say to myself, I don't know that I really like you, Degas. <laughs> you have a cold heart, Degas. <laughs> and I look again. Ah, oh, it's so ravishingly beautiful, the way the light plays over the floorboard and catches on the ribbons. And I'm overwhelmed once again with admiration. All right, well, now you know why I love Sister Wendy, right? <laughs> She's just absolutely... Priceless. Yeah, exactly, thank you, that's the word. So I, you, can, you can, again, you can catch her uh, on, uh, on BBC uh, 
website. You can see, see her on, on, when you get on YouTube. This my, thank you. Uh, this is my first time uh, hearing about Sister Wendy, and I, I think she, she, she makes it worthwhile to oh, watch some of her shows. Sylvia, Sylvia she, I, I joke that she was my first crush. <laughs> and, and, oh. you know, she's just, <laughs> she was just, just splendid. I, I just absolutely uh, fell in love with her. And she, I'm, I'm so glad that that was a program um, that allowed her to, to discuss all the pains. You learned so much, you learned so much from her. And mm -hmm. so I'm glad I, I was able to introduce you to her. Well, uh, as a nun, she held nothing back. Yes. You don't get that habit yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and for those of you, I mean, she has a complete series of DVDs and whatnot, or uh, it, you can spend hours just getting an art education from her, and she goes all over the world. She's so angry. <laughs> she is. She's just phenomenal. So I, I just, I had to share, I had to share her, her you, part of her story. You. Oh, you're welcome. And so now, uh, you know, I, I just want to get a little bit into uh, just a few more paintings, and then we can open up to discussion if anybody has any questions. Um, let me know. I just wanted to go into a few more uh, pieces uh, regarding uh, the, the narrative. So if you don't mind, I want to share with you uh, this piece, which was done back in uh, 2014. And this piece is titled, can you guys see that okay? Yep. Yeah. This piece is titled Sweet Serenade. Now, any takers, any takers? Anybody want to read into this a little bit? Well, I get the it's, sweets it's, part. <laughs> it's also a Mexican, it's a Mexican theme. Ah. With, uh, Dia de los Muertos. Calaveras. Yeah. Calaveras. Ah. Calaveras, yes. Calaveras. calaveras. Now, uh, Daniel, you do Calaveras. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel yeah. would, would read I, this very well. <laughs> yeah, I connect with this imagery almost instantly. It's, um, you know, there, there's um, the concha or the sweet bread right, right in the front, flowers and, and the virgen candle with the little maquette of a, of a calavera playing the guitar. And I feel like, at least for me, when, when you look at the calaveras, they aren't, you know, a symbol of death, they're a symbol of life, you know, and almost uh, a way to, to acknowledge just how important life is and just have that kind of reverence for something so sacred and I think that's echoed in the candle and um, the image of Mary um, Maria and then you have this concha there which is like a day of the dead offering like in, um, in Mexico and, and it's celebrated differently everywhere but during Dia de los Muertos they um, it's a tradition to offer food um, on an altar or on a grave or those that have passed and uh, to remember, I mean, if you have ever seen Coco or whatever, it, yes. it kind of, you, can, yes. you can see the graveyard is not a macabre scene. It's, it's a way to celebrate, you know, your ancestors and those that have passed and that's decorated with flowers and candles and, and, uh, and food also, sometimes their favorite food, whether it's a drink or, or bread. That's what that's that's uh, what I'm seeing. No, this and, and, and a, right. hom a homage to. Yes, this piece is a is is a celebration of life. Now, in the Mexican culture, life and death are merged. Right, we're not afraid of death. Right, we befriend it, and so again, you're reading into that whole offering and everything, and and now. For those of you who don't know, um, this is La Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, Virgin Mary of Guadalupe, and we celebrate her day on December 12th, the day my son was born, my oldest. Yeah. Now, La Calavera in this place, in this term, um, plays a very important role because on that day, what was, should have been a very joyous moment, I almost lost my wife and son. So if this is very deep when you have a candle of La Virgen de Guadalupe, which in, in Aztec, her Aztec name is Tonacin, uh, earthly mother. And so when you light that candle, you say you will do everything within your power spiritually to make things right if you just give me this one wish, right? So 
we're celebrating laughter because death did not take my son or wife. And it is celebrated here with me making this pain, offering this sweetness, this, this bread of life, this, this colorful, enticing, beautiful thing. And it, it is the roses which represent purity. It is a flower that was found in a barren desert. It is a representation of her message to us saying, do not fret, here is my offering to you. Be in peace. And so in the Mexican culture to, to send a mariachi, to send a mariachi on somebody's birthday and to celebrate that momentous occasion, well, I'm celebrating her birthday, but my son's as well. And so there's more to this. But I, uh, I just want to let you know that, that this is a deeply personal piece for me because, again, it, it, was, it was as much as they say, don't fear death. Boy, that, that day was, was a bit hairy. So, you know, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm thankful that my boy now is 10 years old and, uh, and everything's, everything's going well, knock on wood. So, uh, again, I just want to give a little narrative on this one. Any comments? And, uh, before, unless I'll, I'll go to the next one. The next piece is uh, Camellias. Camellias. Camellias, I did this during the pandemic. And for those who don't know, the Camellia is, for centuries, has been a symbol of strength during times of adversity. It is one of the few flowers that will bloom in the horrid winters, right? In frost, it blooms. And so in Victorian times, to send a camellia to someone meant that you longed for them, that you missed them. And here we have three slightly different colors. Um, and in some cultures, these colors represent the three levels of, of, of love, which is partnership, uh, passion, and purity. And so here we are, and, and it's, it's a love letter of sorts to all the people I missed during uh, the pandemic. And so I, uh, I'm really, really happy with this one. It's an 18 by 24. Oh my gosh, the hours, thank goodness we're locked down because the hours it took to create this thing was just <laughs> insane. So uh, any questions or comments regarding this piece? All right, then let um, me go. To, uh, yes. Otto, question. Yes. The leaves, were they real leaves? Yes. yes. They were. Okay. Yes. I was just wondering because I could see the waxiness of um, silk leaves and I wasn't, I was, I was just challenging that's myself. That's how camellias are like. Camellias are like that. Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Good, I have good them answer. Here. Yeah. You have one, Sylvia? I have them here and that, yes. uh, in the, uh, the the middle one the color in the middle one they have bloomed and they the the, the their leaves are exactly like that they look artificial because yeah. they're so thank you for the so explanation <laughs> yeah right. yeah but but they go through stages right they go through um stages and that's what i love about the community too that when you when they these leaves when they're younger they're, they're much more uh, pliable right and and then and it's like even almost slightly velvety silky and then as they get older they get thicker more waxy uh, so you have the different stages of, of leaves. And so one thing I do when I'm doing a study, I really like to study and so, uh, 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 you know, the subject. And so my sister had a, as a comedia bush. And so to, to be able to study these flowers and the way their stages of, of, of growth was really interesting. So I, I wanted to implement that in, in this piece. So thank you, Celia. Uh, yes, Jim Clancy, you raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I'm on your husband's iPad. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I look at this and I read hope. I see the bright colors against the dark atmosphere with the triangular composition. And it just reminds me of the masters again with the triangular going back to the re Renaissance, but also the hope of those colors. Yes, and, and thank you for reading that because it is, it is, it was a dark time. And um, these, these flowers were, were a, a, a sense of hope uh, during that, that dark time. So thank you for reading into that. 
all right, well, my final piece then that I'll be talking about is um, this one here. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong one. Where are you? There you are. So this piece is titled The Last Ride. Any takers? <laughs> Well, we've got that beautiful family in the teacup. Mm -hmm. And apparently there's a, a story to be told with it looks like maybe parents and a young one together. And it's titled The Last Ride. So there must be a meaning behind the composition here. Yeah, yeah, yes. I'm sorry, I, I know you have Jim on your name, but what is, what is your, I'm sorry, your name, huh? My name is Patty. Patty, okay, Patty, I'm so sorry. Okay, go ahead. I was just thinking about the idea of um, life going on, and it looks like it's almost like you're ride, going through a ride to your, um, like, aging and going back to the background. We have the foreground and the background going back in an S-curve. Kind of reminds me, again, of, of you know, the, the idea of going, going beyond. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, this piece was the last ride for this little girl. Right? Oh. It was late in the night, which you can read into it, like saying, well, this could be the last ride because the park's gonna close down. But this brave little girl who um, I, I put a tiara on her, a little crown, a princess, um, battled different forms of cancer for many years of her life. It stunted her growth. And when she finally got the okay, to go out into the world without a mask, without anything. They said, where do you want to go? She says, I want to ride the teacups at Disneyland. And so when you read into this, the parents and the, 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 the three generations of women here in a circle, a bit somber, but so much light, so much color, so much going on. Look at life whizzing around them, just flashing around them. And yet the focus, is on so slow growth and dependency. Life is just spinning around them. In the happiest place on earth, what were they thinking in that little teacup? Mm -hmm. So you have these bystanders, so to speak. Right? You have a father, little, little boy nestled in his barely visible next to him. You know, it is a somber scene, in fact. And yet, for that little girl, it was the happiest moment of her life. She couldn't stop talking about it all the way home. And so this is homage to the children, to the woman who have to live in this whirlwind, this blur of problems that come up and to see our children suffering. We have to remember that life in some form or another is still very colorful. And you have to listen to the joy in your children's voice and in their hearts. So the last ride is a little homage to this little girl who passed away a few years ago and it, it's a lesson for me. Um, I, it, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, bittersweet. We're having to work on this piece, and but I'm I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. So I didn't want to end on a sour note, but I do hope you guys take this and understand that paintings can have such tremendous meaning. And perhaps more than anything, maybe perhaps more for the artist than anybody else. But when you take your narrative, yes, it doesn't have to be as deep as this, it doesn't, but take it and run with it because it really is about you. It's your work, it's your creativity, it's your time in front of that two dimensional piece. Make it yours. Tell your story. How will history remember you? 
So with that, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I'll stop sharing and then uh, we can get into some uh, Q&A if you like. So thank you everyone again for uh, listening to my presentation. Thanks, Otto. Much appreciated. Thank that was you. so beautiful, Otto. Thank you. Oh, Bravo, Otto. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Otto. Powerful, super powerful. Wow. Oh. Yep. So, uh, hey, Otto, your, your teacup painting, is it owned by the family? It is. It is. What? We discussed we discussed how to how to pay tribute to her. So I had to I had to visit Disneyland and 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 just you know take it in. So uh, get reference and all that good stuff. So you know mm -hmm. I uh, yeah it was it was quite a project. It was quite a project. So I, I'm glad I did it. I'm really really glad I did it. Uh, you know, I haven't even been into the chat, so I'm, I'm, I forgive me if I missed anybody. Uh, any questions? Anything on the chat that I missed? Anything? It's been oh, pretty Otto? active. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering your background on the floral painting, the camellias. Yes. What, yeah. What uh, you usually use kind of a mix, don't you? It's not I do. always just I do. pure black. I do. I do. Thank you for noticing. Um, yeah, so in, in many of my blacks, and I love the jewel blacks because they're probably the blackest blacks that I've found. And uh, and what I do is I take I take it and then I typically glaze the color over it, right? So it's almost like smoothing the frosting. I'll, I'll take a I'll, 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 I'll take another pastel, just lightly glide over it, and whether with a uh, a pointy pastel uh, stick uh, or a mm -hmm. pastel or just layers of pastel pencils to give it that that kind of atmospheric richness. So, yeah, anybody else? So Otto, I have a question about, I mean, you know, you've told this beautiful narrative, but there's a process to get there. Let's go back to the camellias. Um, so you, you, you have your model, you know, your flowers. Um, you're on, we're on both screen, so I'm sorry if my, <laughs> my eyes are shifting. <laughs> I'll talk to the gallery here. Um, but, uh, you know, did you photograph in a, Box. I mean, did you you worked off a reference photograph, or were you trying to work? You know, no. Actually, your... actually, this actually this piece um, was actually photographed uh, with it, Margie's home. So she had this beautiful camellia bush, and we we went outside and we put it together, and, and uh, I took the took the shots. So um, you know, unfortunately, with some of the stuff, you you wish you could you could paint all of it from life, but it. it my technique just doesn't allow for um, for that. I mean, right. you could, I'd love to have reference in front of me and I do have some north light windows, uh, but I do have to take some photo reference in order to to be able to to complete the piece. But did and, you set that up in a box, like a three-sided box or something with your uh, light? I believe we did, yes, yes. I, I, I typically, yes, I typically, okay. typically built uh, some some sort of uh, box or so that, you know, that we, we control the light, we control um, the atmosphere, so yes. Yes. Uh, the other thing too is um, in, in recording the narrative, you know, I just wanted to, to note that many of my paintings have a title before they're even painted, right? So the story kind of grows and I write notes and it develops and I become an author before I become an artist. And so once the story is, is solid and I feel very comfortable with that and I feel connected to it, then I use that story to implement it into my painting. And I I make sure that the story is there. Now, I, I try not to divert too much from it, right? So what's the focus? What's the main plot? What is it? And then you have all these little kind of subplots and whether it's color or I use directionals, right? Where I, I, I use either color or I use some kind of object to point you to a direction to where I want you to go. So that all is part of the story. So it's not just about the narrative, the meaning, the symbolic meaning behind it, but it's also about how you compose your piece so that the viewer knows where to go and what to pay attention to. And sometimes a focal point is actually subdued because I want you to really look. I want you to notice. And so I look for rhythmic patterns. I look for abstract shadows, even when there is this much, much, even when there's this much detail. Um, I try not to make everything look like a cutout. I mean, you know, I, 
you evolve. I've been evolving as an artist and, I, and I'm trying to change what I do a little bit so that I, I feel like um, not everything is, is cut out or too hard edge. So I'm looking for those lost and founds. And that's all part of the narrative. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question, Otto. Do you? Oh, uh, oh my God. Oh, and... It's the critter. Is there it? You want to see the critter? <laughs> yeah, I want to see the critter. Oh, the baby. Plus, the you, Apollo. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the care. What a warm welcome. Thank you for that. <laughs> oh, oh, congratulations. Yeah. I've got you pinned. So the baby <laughs> lost. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's been a joy. It's been a joy. And uh, it's been uh, a lesson in sleep deprivation and time management and all that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah sleep I, I, management. I, I, management. Yeah. <laughs> well you know, done, with, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks. Well, with my composition, sometimes I'll, I'll go right into a painting, you know, um, if I can, just a quick sketch or something like that. But I often plan out um, compositions using thumbnails and my sketchbook and just fill it up. Do you do that, Otto? Do you? I, I do. I do. I have uh, <clears throat> my screw, screws and shambles, but yes, I try to take visual notes of what I'm trying to convey. And um, sometimes I use stop bubbles, right? Uh, and uh, connect that. But, but yes, the more I paint, the more I realize those studies are important, right? The initial sketch, the you know, the, the, the scribbles, the, the, all, all that, all that matters. And, and then the value scale, right? The value study and the color study, all those things are much more important to me now than they used to be. And that's because it helps me create a stronger narrative, right? So it's not just about the story, but it is about the whole of the painting and, and how I want the viewer to, to, to see my, my piece, right? So that it's cohesive. And uh, so, yes, I do do that. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Otto, there's a question in the chat. Yes. Um, Javier wanted to know, did you say you used pastel pencils for the I, camellias? I do. Uh, for the what? For the camellias painting? Yeah, I use everything. I use everything. So I use, I use, everything from super soft pastels like Schminka to the hard pastels, which are Rembrandt, uh, New Pastel. Uh, but my, my workhorses tend to be my Giro's, uh, my Terry's, uh, the Unison's and our Jack Richardson's. So uh, that in combination with my pastel pencils, which I use, um, uh, my workhorses are Carbothello, Grand Dache, is that how you say it? And then, uh, and then credit color. So each one serves a little different purpose, right? Where the Carbothellos uh, are not the softest, the Grand Dache is, is a little softer. Um, so each one has a either a nicer range of colors, some have more grays, but you know, many times to get certain texture, I, I lay on the layers and then I take that pastel pencil and I hold it and I, 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 get, let me, I get a wide point on it. Let me pull one here, give me a quick second. So here's a stabilo. I get quite a point on it, right? You guys see that? <laughs> and, and so I use, what, yes, you can use it for detail, but when you use a broad stroke, right? And I use it almost like a, in a metronome fashion, you glaze and you can get the most subtle transitions, right? And so that's how I use my pencils. I'm using the broad side uh, to, to create those, those subtle transitions or for those fine little details, you know, you get that nice point. And again, I sharpen these with a crap knife. So um, yeah, I, I, I do use, and I have buckets of, of pastel pencils all in, uh, in hues. So, and same thing with my pastel, uh, with my pastel sticks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Who's, who's your harshest critic at home? Who gives you just the unfiltered, critique you need <laughs> well, that would be me um no <laughs> uh, that would be maybe my oldest son Diego because he's turning out to be quite an artist he's very observant very observant and uh so you know and uh he, he's actually he's he's actually good he's good it's like he's got he's got like 
Oh, yeah, good point. Okay, <laughs> so definitely need to work on that. Yeah. And he'll come in too when he's really, you know, because he's not easy to please. And he'll he'll come in, he's like, whoa, that looks that looks really good. I'm like, oh, all right, good day for me. <laughs> um, Thanks. So <laughs> you just wait. <laughs> and, uh, and so yeah, so it's 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 nice to get that interaction from from kids, you know, because kids, you know, very little filters. <laughs> so you know, they'll they'll let you know. So they speak the truth. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I have a question, and if somebody else has a question regarding your technique and whatnot, but um, for those of you who don't know, and I don't know why you wouldn't, if you're a member of the society, we have a show that's uh, right now we're accepting uh, for online jury shows, and as members, everyone oh, yes. you get to uh, participate in our 13th annual member show. Uh, and your host here this evening, Otto, he'll be our judge of the show. So once you get past the juring process, submitting up to three paintings that can be accepted, uh, there will be a judging session. And so would you mind maybe sharing with us some, some of the things that you're looking for and uh, to help those of us, number one, you know, um, what to do while we're creating our paintings and why it's important to enter shows to begin with. Why yes. is it important? Well, I, I, well, I, I think it's important. I think it's important because it's you, you. I'm constantly challenging myself. Just like I mentioned behind me, um, this is homework that I'm doing for Aurelio Rodriguez's class. That he, it's a monthly class, um, and so you know, I'm always constantly taking classes from other artists that that I'm fascinated by. So uh, you know, Glenn Maxson, I've taken his class and I think it's phenomenal. You know, uh, Liz Haywood Sullivan. Uh, I take everything from impressionist artists to the realist, like Aurelio. And so it's very important to challenge yourself, getting back to that point. Um, strive to grow because you're gonna, it's fulfilling. It's fulfilling for me anyhow, right? And so um, it's fun. It's fun to, to go up against your, your peers and to be recognized. Uh, every judge is different. Every juror is different. And so for me personally, I, like I say, if you've ever taken a workshop from me, uh, my motto is, if you're, you know, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. So, you know, I want you to have fun doing your pieces. It's going to show. It's going to show. And so I, I don't have a bias to, towards realist, realism just because I'm a realist, right? A representational artist. I don't care how you paint the work, you know, whether it's abstract or not. I know when you had fun with the piece, I know when you were thoughtful about composition and design and color and value and composition, I will, I will see that. I will see that. And so be your critic. Be your own first critic before anybody else criticizes it, right? Ask peers, right? Ask your friends, hey, you know, don't instruct me on this, but what can you tell me? Can you critique this, please? Can you, I, I honor, um, uh, I, I honor your comments, and so please, can you, can you, you know, what do you think? What's missing? What's what? Step away from it from a day or two. Come back to it. Um, and so, uh, I I look at several different criteria, and and uh, and, and one of those being, um, how did you use that medium, you know? And so, so there's a, a you know, how did you compose it? How did you play? Um, with the story, if there is a story, it doesn't have to, you know, but it'll come across, you know. So, so yeah, I, I, I was, I have fun, you guys, have fun with the painting because, you know, it, 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 uh, it'll, it'll help you grow if you just try to alleviate some of that frustration. Part of alleviating that frustration is to be honest with yourself and ask and create. And this is what Team Thursday is about, right? We're here to discuss and say, hey, you guys, um, does anybody have any recommendation on this? Um, can anybody help me with this or that? So uh, ask your peers and hopefully you guys will, will uh, enter into the show because I'm really looking forward to seeing all of your pieces. And you know, one, one other thing, Otto, I don't know if Kath mentioned it, but every member is guaranteed one piece in the show. Correct, thank so you. So if you're a member, get your piece out there because if it's hiding in your closet, no one sees it, what mm -hmm. could it, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you, you know, just pick what you think is your best piece and put it out there and you will get feedback, right? So 
I've always encouraged everyone to enter the show and you've got until March 31st. So you've got a little more time and right. we're all a family here and we're all very forgiving. So we, just put it on the wall. <laughs> thank you. We are supportive, right? Which is the reason why I joined PSS because you were welcoming, you were supportive and, and we, we, we want uh, that quality to shine, right? Camaraderie. So get your pieces in. We want to see your, your work, you know, you should be proud. You should be proud of your work, you know? We're not here to, you know, put you down. We're here to elevate you. We're here to empower you. So feel good about being in a show with your peers. You know, this is a member show. Show that, you know, some, some PSSC pride. And uh, so, yeah, let's let's see those pieces because I'm excited. Take the next step for yourself. It's really about taking that next step for yourself, not comparing yourself to other people. Look, Sivica sent her piece from Portugal and she sold it in our last show. Like, wow, you know, congratulations, Sivia. Right? Wow. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, yeah. I, I actually have a question for you. Yes. Uh, I was... I was contemplating about that. Uh, I haven't been um, I haven't been active in painting lately. I haven't painted in uh, more than six months. Uh, pastel wise, I have been dabbling in acrylics, and um, but I, I'm always interested in in the in in these kinds of shows with you. Uh, and I'm not sure about the dates. I, I don't know how long we have between the judging comes out and how, and the, the piece has to be there because it was a hard. It was a hardship last time for me. And uh, I was wondering how, how long do you have uh, for that? Well, luckily we have Mr. Chris Stillians here. Yeah, to, he's here. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> from the time that the juring is completed, you will have almost a month, about three, three and a half weeks to get your paintings in into in us. You know, so okay. you, there's a fair amount of time. Do we have a date? Um, the, the judging, I believe was on the 25th, I think of April for, oh, but, the, but that's for, no. So Chris, uh, unless the calendar is no, no, the submission for the submission, no, for the submission, for the submission. So we wanted the take-in was going to be April 23rd. That's the day that we bring the paintings in to hang. So if it's at my house prior to the 23rd, those paintings, whatever is there will be brought over. And then the uh, the judging is going to occur on the 24th, unless you've changed the date out of that's, that is, can be totally a fluid date. It doesn't have to be that date, but our opening is on the 27th for the exhibition. Oh, the, thir the 30th is the reception. And the 30th is the award ceremony and reception, but we open a couple days early. But the deadline is March, 31st for online for shows. So you have to have your images uploaded digitally by March oh, 31st. Okay. Yeah. And that's okay, all that's in the prospectus. Was... If you go to the website, you can find the prospectus. And also we sent a MailChimp email about that. And we'll be sending another one to remind you. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. I didn't, didn't really read it. Thank you. And also, if you can attend our meeting this Saturday, you'll get a lot more information. We have our general meeting, right, Kath? This yeah. Saturday. We do. That that's, that's coming out. Yeah. At 10 o'clock. And we also have a panel of artists and mentors that will uh, be, be joining us. And uh, uh, one of our, uh, Desmond O'Hagan, basically coming from Colorado, will be joining oh. us. And uh, a couple of surprises there. So that'll be a really fun meeting. And you'll have great opportunities to ask more questions about how to make your art better and what these uh, this panel looks for in their judging. And that's why, Otto, we had wanted you to kind of tell us what what it is as another person who's doing a judging uh, and has experience with that. Uh, I guess maybe you're looking for something that makes the story is being told to you and you feel something. There's a connection for you. Uh, you know, I uh, yes, every I mean, every juror wants to be connected to a police or miss why they, you know, they're 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 drawn to it. And, and what is it about? Um, that piece, and like I said, it doesn't have to be a, a narrative, like an, alleg an allegorical painting. It just has to tell you a story about light or shadow, rhythm, um, you know, mark making, whatever it might be. Um, and like I said, it'll it'll shine. It'll shine. Just just uh, you know, put your best into it, and and you know, be be uh, thoughtfully critical of yourself. Right? Don't put yourself down. 
And uh, because you have to understand that, that I, don't, I don't want anybody to be intimidated about entering this show. You shouldn't be intimidated, right? Every artist that you admire was once at your level, right? Whatever level you might be at. So, you know, when we consider somebody a master, well, they weren't always a master, right? And, oh, they were naturally talented. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure they put a lot of hours into it. So, you know, it takes a, it takes a lot of work. It takes a, a lot of observation and putting that into practice. So, you know, let's put those hours in and get those paintings in. So, um, Otto, Robert has a question uh, wanting to know, how do you blend? How do I blend? Okay, well, typically I don't use my fingers. Um, I don't use my fingers as much as um, some other artists do. And I, I, I tend to allow the colors to blend into one another. Now, yes, I'll use my finger here and there for uh, an edge or sometimes, you know, just to kind of creep something up, up on an edge. So, you know, it's not like I won't do it. But um, I, I typically don't use stumps. I don't use anything like that. Um, every once in a while, I'll do an underpainting with, uh, with the, um, oh, what do you call those? The uh, watercolors? No, yeah, uh, I'll well. do watercolors, but the, uh, the, the, little, the little cups. Dr. Martin? Uh, no, no, no. They're the actual pastel ones with the sponges. New pastel? New pastel? Pan pastel. Pan pastel. Pan pastel. Thank you. Jeez. Oh, Pan pastel. Yeah, pan pastel. But I, I, there's no recipe to, to the way I work a painting. It's just what I think will get me to that, to that, uh, to that finish. Whether, you know, if I need a certain texture, maybe I'll, I'll work this way or that. But uh, to answer your question, it's typically with the pastels. And then maybe I smooth it out if it needs to with the pastel pencil. So that's typically uh, how I work. And I'm, I also, I, I don't always work from left to right, it seems like more and more, I'm working more like a sculpture where I'm, I'm working the piece all in, in, in you know, as, 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 as if it were a, a, a slab of marble, just kind of honing in on the detail and making sure that all the valleys and the color harmonies are there um, so that it's, it's all working cohesively. Does that answer your question, Robert? Hopefully. All right. So uh, any other questions? If not, I'll leave it up to you. Open comments. Any, you know, you guys, uh, you know, we have uh, we have quite a few things coming up. Um, one thing, if you guys just, uh, if you guys will humor me, I do have a workshop coming up. There are some spots available if you'd like to join us at the uh, at the uh, fellowship hall at RUMC in Redondo Beach. Um, you can find that link on my website under workshops. It's stripstudio.com. Uh, it's on April twenty first to the twenty third. Uh, it is from a nine to four, and we're going to be working on a classic still life. So we're going to get into that, but we're going to, we, I use a lot of contemporary techniques. Um, it, it's about, it's application based. You don't have to be, you know, uh, a, a super tight artist, you know, and, uh, and draw it's, we're going to be taking it to the level that you want to take it. So it's good for beginners to advanced and, um, hopefully you'll join us. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to, you can, uh, you can go on to, uh, uh my website. A strip studio and uh and it's a you are sponsored workshop so you're gonna get some goodies you're gonna get some goodies mm. and uh yeah so so again hope to see you there there's also a workshop coming up uh reese i don't know if you want to talk about that or is that just strictly for your members uh no it's open to everybody um we are uh, in the central coast here at uh, beautiful nipomo uh, california uh and we are on a resort called uh, monarch june and uh, we do have the heart center. So I uh, invited Hoto to uh, come and uh, give us a uh, pastel class two days. So he's gonna be our first master we invite this year. So we're very happy about that. Thank you for uh, accepting to come. Oh, and it's gonna be in, in May. Uh, we're hoping uh, a demo on the 19th and then the two day workshop would be on the 20th and the 21st. Um, so it's open, but uh, space is limited here. Uh, we don't have a huge uh, studio. Uh, I think we can fit 10 is pretty packed. So 10 would be the maximum. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. So hopefully if you, if you can't make Star MC and you want to go to Napomo, uh, I'll be more than happy to see you there. Great to see you, Maurice. Yeah, thank you, Maurice. <laughs> I just hey, got a tour. I got a tour of her beautiful place last weekend, and it's going to be <laughs> wonderful. So I hope you guys can take that, take that little yes. trip. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Come and visit. Far. 
It's near <laughs> Pismo Beach. If if everybody knows Pismo Beach, is there are beautiful beaches around here, oh, and yeah. of course we're in the wine country. So <laughs> what's not to love? <laughs> Only three hours. It's a nice weekend trip. So easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys, thank we you. Have, we have I, about. Uh, I, oh, you yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Sorry. I also just need to say thank you to everybody for the warm welcome and you know the Pastel Society sent us a little heart-shaped planter with uh, some succulents in there so sincere thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Well, we can't uh, wait until he's big enough to be a member of the society. <laughs> Start blooming it right now. And we, we will be discussing a youth program. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's been my muse lately. I've been able to <laughs> uh several little studies of him and maybe i should do one in pastel you know um for the show i don't know i've, I've got more pastels for you daniel so just oh, yeah yeah like uh they're small that's like all i can really get oh, oh, that's awesome. thanks. Thanks. Well, you know what we've got we've got about 10 minutes left you guys so if anybody wants to share their artwork what they've been working on um anything that they got going on let's hear it yeah the latest in progress. There you oh go. Oh my gosh! Oh that's my awesome. gosh. Oh, <laughs> oh, he grows yeah. so fast. <laughs> I know. I know they grow so. Fast. Um, but yeah, this has been great. I'm so glad to have had time to jump on here and and see your presentation, Otto. It's it's really a lot of great information, making me think hard about allegory and composition. So I really appreciate that. Oh, well, I, I I appreciate you being here. I appreciate everyone coming to. This presentation, I, I hope I didn't put all of you to sleep. Oh, I, I, I sincerely appreciate. It. I sincerely no, it's a, it's a big, uh, it's a big eye opener, uh, especially for me who uh, doesn't have a background in art at all. I, I took up art, you know, I, when I first joined the Pastel Society, I was just barely a baby, and, uh, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really amazing to see how deep you can go into your, your thought process before you know you decide on the piece. So, this yeah. is a lot of food for thoughts for me. You know, this was wonderful. Thank Thank you. Oh, good thank point. You. And yeah. I'd like to remind everybody that these uh, are recorded and they are loaded up onto our YouTube channel. So for those, uh, you know, we, we had, I think, about 47 people that um, had signed on uh, for this evening. But for the, your friends that you know that aren't on the screens this evening, let them know. Daniel did a wonderful presentation a couple months ago on Calaveras and Glenn uh, Maxim did one uh, just a couple weeks ago very, very valuable information. And so uh, it's here for you to be able to use and uh, keep in your educational background and uh, your library. Well, I, uh, I also want to thank Kat, if you don't mind, I, I just went through some of the, the messages. So thank you everyone for the wonderful compliments, your questions. Sibia, I would love to go to Europe to, to see. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, guys, all maybe, you. maybe I can work something out with uh, with Aurelio, and so uh, maybe I'll do a little European tour. So I would love to see you in Portugal. That would be one. I love Portuguese food. It's just <laughs> you know, so yeah. And you would and, love here because in the island here we have special stuff that they don't have in the mainland, uh -huh. like lapas. Oh, oh. 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 Right. sold. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit shop in Portugal. Portugal. I say we need a PSSC trip. We do, we do. Oh, yes, do, we do. can make it happen. <laughs> yeah. That would be we an adventure. Do. That would be a nice adventure. We do. Yeah. Uh, so and, and keep an eye out, you guys. We're gonna have a nice bloom here in California. So uh, it's coming. So if you guys want to get out and paint, you know, I I, I know we kept talking about uh, doing a a PSSC uh, uh, you know bus field trip, right? So hopefully that'll that'll come around next year. Hopefully. All right. So, no idea. Yeah, that would be that would be seriously yeah. awesome. I know uh, Carl's bat is blooming right now too. So is it? How yeah, are the poppies doing further I'm north? I'm watching the Antelope Valley. You can watch the live cam in Antelope Valley at the well, reserve, and they're slowly uh, starting. So go on Antelope Valley Reserve and look at the live cam. You can yeah. see it. Yeah. Poppies Arvin, are blooming Arvin, Arvin, in Mariposa. Ar yeah. Oh yes, Mariposa. Well, Arvin too is is blooming oh, yeah. poppies and and everything. But uh, Carl's bat, the tulips, tulips are, are blooming. So, yeah. Well, I just rented charter buses for my daughter's wedding, so I know how to rent a bus now. So when you guys are ready for the field trip, <laughs> I am the charter bus expert. <laughs> That's so I want to I want to thank uh, I want to thank again PSCC staff for everything they do. Lupe, thank you so much for 
for me, you know, our website, our website looks phenomenal. Thank you guys. You know, for all you members who haven't visited the pssc.website.org, please do so because um, a lot of, a lot of work has gotten into that and it's just wonderful. So, um, you know, thanks again for, for keeping up the calendar. Uh, and, uh, and don't forget you guys, uh, our next theme Thursday is on the 24th, our one year anniversary of theme Thursday. And all right. Dave, Dave Del Bianco, who gave our first Theme Thursday on Animals, will be reprising his role as <laughs> Maestro. Uh, and he uh, he will be doing uh, dogs. He'll be doing dogs. He's going to teach dogs. How, his so technique cool. for, for uh, how, he, how he does his dogs. He's phenomenal. He's doing, he's doing such a wonderful job with his, with yeah. his sketches. So um, we, we look forward to that. We hope to get to see you guys on March 24th. Same time, same, same bat place, right? Same bat channel? Same bat Same, same, same bat channel, play. right. <laughs> That's right. So, and again, I hope to see everybody on Saturday. You know, don't, yes. Don't know meeting. We have a lot of information coming up about the exhibition. And uh, Chris, you know, uh, will be speaking a lot. Aren't you, Chris? <laughs> Chris, 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 Lynn, all of them. Yes, the I will. <laughs> uh, everybody has been working such uh, long hours and all of this. These, these, these exhibitions aren't easy to put together. No. So, mm -hmm. Please honor honor your honor your 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 uh, members uh, your board members by by you know loading them up with artwork for the show. So yes. they love they love to hang it. Make us work. <laughs> Make them work. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Chris, let me know if you need any assistance. I will. Whoops. You're on my list. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's, it's also a, thank you very much for uh, being. Our uh, star tonight, and it was really very interesting. Uh, even though you're mentioning old artists who are 300 years old, <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly appreciate it, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad I could do so. So, yeah, if you guys, if you guys want to do uh, a, a theme, a theme Thursday, let us know. Again, it, it can be it can be very informal. You don't have to do a presentation like this, or like the one that. that uh, Glenn did or Lynn did. It's just a matter of pick a theme and we'll paint. We'll paint. Yeah. So, you know, uh, it, that's it be, you know, Otto, it'd be great to do somebody like Turner, the uh, British painter ah. who, who, who changed his whole style uh, during his lifetime after his father passed away. And it, it, it looks like that he just the shackles were removed. Wow. And while he was painting very realistically, uh, at a certain point in his life, he just threw that overboard and started to paint completely differently. Um, I know you there's know, a movie made watch. about him, but the movie doesn't say anything about this fantastic change in his lifestyle. Yeah, that's very interesting. Daniel? I was going to say, I was going to watch some Sister Wendy, but now I'll just listen to Bernard. You know, <laughs> present next time on Theme Thursday about uh, Turner. That sounds like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Daniel uh, and um, uh, Otto, you ought to give a big cheer for the BBC. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yes. Oh yes! I, I, like I said, you know, Otto, you ought to. Otto, I ought to. Oh, ought to. I ought to. Yeah. I ought to. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. For hey, you guys, we're getting some questions in the chat about this Saturday's meeting. This Saturday's okay. meeting is via Zoom. You should have received an email. If you did not, please email me. I did get it. At info at pssc.website.org, and any one of us on the board can answer that. But you should be able to register for the meeting. And if you register, you're eligible for the raffle. You also have to be on the screen, not only register, but be on the screen to be eligible to win prizes. And then in May, Kath, correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like we will try to go back to in-person meetings. Yay! Yes. And we will correct. also have a hybrid Zoom portion of that. So if you're international or somewhere else in the United States and can't get to the in-person meeting in Redondo Beach, you will also be able to connect in through the hybrid yeah, version. So right. everyone can be included. So Lynn, I'm sorry, did you say Raphael? Yeah, Raphael, yes. A very important, very important Raphael. <laughs> what are the prizes this weekend? What are the prizes on Saturday? Well, because we are on Zoom and we have people from all over, we are going to be doing four Dakota gift certificates. Woo! So uh, there are four chances and opportunities to win. And right. then we'll go back to our regular prizes 
uh, you know, once we're back in person. So uh, gotcha. we're all looking forward to that. And we'll do something for our Zoom people. So thank you. Right. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Saturday. Yay. Absolutely. All right. all right. Great turnout tonight, everybody. Yeah, great turnout, guys. Thank you, everybody. Well, we're coming uh, to, we're coming thank to you, Otto. I'm going to.